So this is very appropriate. We had some slight sound um, differentials. You know, in uh, Gabriella's talk, there were some weird things going on on the screen. That's the medium saying, saying hello. These weird scratching noises were the medium saying hello. Um, welcome back after the break. Um, I'm very happy to um, uh, see you here. It's, it's interesting how the crowd shifts. I have, you know, this morning more people are sitting over here. Now this morning we have more people sitting over here. I don't know exactly where to address, but um, <clears throat> it is my pleasure to introduce to you um, two speakers who will not only be speaking and, and presenting on the topic um, that we see on the screen, binary anachronisms, embodying the digital with analog sound, but will also be performing for us tonight. Um, and I think the presentation might give us an idea of what we might uh, expect tonight. Um, uh, the two people I'm proud to introduce are Atau Tanaka and Adam Parkinson. Atau Tanaka's uh, first influences came from meeting John Cage, and um, this inspired him to go on to recreate Cage's variations number seven with Matt Wand and Soviet France. He formed censor band with Zbigniew Karkowski and Edwin van der Heide, and SSS, that's um, Sonic Sound, Sensor Sonic Sites, yes, where I actually first heard you here in Berlin at the Club Transmediale, and then you, you were doing some very amazing work with um, acoustic interfaces. I think back then it was ultrasound interfaces, you know, using bodily gestures to control the sound. So um, this is why I approached you for this conference. And um, you created uh, that band with Cecile Babiol and Laurian Dalio, and you have released on uh, different labels, Sub Rosa, Bip Hop, Touch, Ash, Sonoris, and you are currently leading a new research group for the Metagesture Music at Goldsmiths. And um, there's actually much more biographical information that I could share with you, but since you sent me um, so, uh, a longer version than Adam, and you sent me less information, I sort of shortened yours to make them fit together. And um, the, his, the partner in crime today is Adam Parkinson, who has worked alongside with artists such as Rotary, Davis, Klaus Philipp, Robin Hayward, Dominic Lash, and Kathy Matthews. Your, uh, um, Adam has releases on Entract, Unique Three's Mutate Records, Seabag's Noodles, and 16K Record. Records. He also dabbles in making dance music and under various guises has remixed Maximo Park, Dextra, and others. So we have a you know, broad, broad spectrum here from uh, Soviet France to uh, Maximo Park of you know, just thinking about working with sound. And I'm very, very um, intrigued to find out what you have uh, prepared for us today. And with that, I would just step down from the stage and welcome you up. And so a warm welcome for Adam Parkinson and Atal Tanaka, please. Well, um, hello everyone, and thanks very much for having us here, Mark and everyone. Um, I feel I should begin this with a bit of a disclaimer. There's been a lot of very, um, a very, sort of very smart talks. I feel like I'm just going to try and reflect on things as a musician, um, a musician who's always worked with digital, um, with digital sound and with digital tools. From you know, my first instrument is the computer, which sounds kind of silly, but it was actually kind of using some software that I'd got on a uh, came free with some cereals, a very you know worthwhile packet of cereals, getting when I was about twelve, and that on my parents' computer, like cutting up sound and and way more than guitars or anything like that. It's always been with computers and mostly digital tools that have enabled me to kind of. Um, uh, um, explore the musical ideas that I've been interested in. Um, and I suppose our talk um, is, uh, I think both of us are going to reflect in different ways about the, um, the fact that it sometimes it doesn't necessarily make sense to talk about this idea of, of the digital as being something completely separate, because through music, um, uh, I seem to always encounter these hybrid systems, and, um, and that's what I'm going to talk about. And I found... Um, I couldn't resist this kind of slightly silly image from the um, uh, what's a lomography lum site, but um, yeah, there's, in music we're always encountering these balances of, 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 of analog and digital. And I was going to talk about how, as a, through music, three um, areas that I encounter that I think uh, sort of problematizes and reveals kind of difficulties in the idea of the, the digital as being something necessarily separate or, or disembodied and such things. And that's the fact that we, um, we're always listening to analog sound anyway. Sound is a, an, an analog phenomenon. Um, 
uh, or music is, perhaps rather. Um, and the way in which, um, particular to the practice of Atto and I, we're um, interfacing um, with digital instruments through the body as we look at different ways of controlling um, instruments. But the interface is always this embodied analog thing that, that sort of often messes up this idea of a, a clean digital world. And also, I think through music, you find very much how digital is something that's a, an aesthetic. The idea of like, you know, analog synths and the digital sounds, it's often um, not really got anything to do with actually analog and digital, but forms part of how we conceptualize analog and digital and our relationship to them. Um, so, yeah, to look at listening, sound is, is, is always this analog thing in the end. It's, it's sound waves. And listening is always something that's embodied. It's always done through the whole, through the whole body, and it's not just a case of a, a brain decoding this, uh, this, this information. And if we imagine the digital and, and digital sound as being this sort of um, uh, precise, discrete, but reductionist, and it loses information... Um, Sound is still this um, incredibly fuzzy thing and a multiplicity that's it's always unpredictable in its actualizations. You don't know how playing a, a CD in a different room through a different system will sound differently. How you enjoy a bit of music will, will be completely dependent upon your mood, you know, where you're listening to it. Have you had a drink? What's going on? What sort of sound system is it? Um, so whilst sound is something that can be digitized and stored and, and maybe we have this idea that, that it's sort of made clean and, and sort of turned into this, this representation that's lost some sort of magic, as soon as it comes back out in the world again, music is, it's never digital, it's this embodied thing that'll be different to everyone and it, it, I think that that's um, uh, important. Um, and um, uh, sort of second area... Um, is uh, playing, and I think that um, uh, musicians interface with the digital in, um, in loads of different ways, and this can be from kind of um, MIDI controllers to um, a lot of different practices that I think Atta might end up touching upon a bit more, um, using biosensors um, or, uh, or sort of studio composition techniques where you're quite removed and you're using a keyboard and a mouse, or maybe you're using faders. Um, but there's all these very different ways that musicians are sort of exploring these, these different ways of interacting with a, with a computer. Um, and it might be that some of these are very embodied ways in which the body is, is, uh, is sort of definitively brought back, brought back in. The computer's not mediating, but we're strapping sensors to ourselves and, um, and the music feels intimately connected to your bodily um, functions. That maybe sounds wrong. Um, <laughs> uh, but, um, uh, for instance, an earlier project that Atto and I did was performing using iPhones, trying to have an iPhone in each hand as a, as a sensor instrument using the accelerometer in the iPhone to turn these movements into sound. And it began as thinking about uh, using the iPhone as a gestural instrument. But I think what actually got created, and I'll play a video in a couple of minutes, was an instrument where you had to remain incredibly still to play it, um, to try and preserve a sound and keep, a, keep things in the right key and stuff. And if you sort of say accidentally drink too much coffee and things like that <laughs> then you'll start shaking and you have all of these little gestures and fluctuations these very organic bodily sounds brought into a very digital sound world and the digital instantly this although it's a digital instrument it instantly stops being this kind of controlled clean thing it's something that's, that's unpredictable and, and tied to this failing over caffeinated body that should have gone to bed earlier um, but there's also ways in which the computer can mediate the effect of the body um, through things like live coding, which is people doing live programming of, of, of dance music, or very minimal interfaces. We can kind of um, we can stop the sort of uh, well, we can look at the way in which we as musicians can develop habits and how a computer can stop those habits and physical gestures from necessarily affecting the music when we don't want it to. Um, and, uh, yeah, so interfaces are where these, these habits form, and, and through playing a computer, the, the body and the habits of the body can often be, be brought back in. Um, also, these uh, musical interfaces are where we, um, we structure our relationship with computers and digital tools as creative things. For instance, I've started to realise that being a digital musician 
primarily means being sort of quite good at updating Facebook um, on a regular basis and much less about actually, often actually creating because we're using this accounting tool or, or this word processor, this sort of uh, jumped up uh, typewriter with a very high opinion of itself to try and be a creative tool. And this is quite a difficult thing to, to deal with. It's wonderful because the computer is this thing of possibilities, but it's also in this... Um, we also have to kind of structure and limit. And I'll briefly just show what I'm performing with tonight, which is, it's a computer, but it's a single board computer. So it's just this here. And I'll plug this into a, a cheap and unimaginative MIDI controller and try and play with that. And you could check your email and update Facebook on this, but the fact that it's not, <laughs> it's not connected to a screen and we're not, it's just, you're trying to figure out a way of turning this accounting tool or this, this gateway into this digital world is something that is much less than that and is just letting you use these quite specific digital sound processing techniques to let you do granular synthesis because you like the sound of it, but to try and shut off the rest of what the digital might mean. Um, and um, also, yeah, through um, the way that we choose to play computers and interact with computers, a lot of this is about mapping and about you can invest meanings and invest ways of using the body, um, or you can invest gestures with certain meaning. And that's, um, I think, quite an interesting, um, uh, interesting <coughs> area. And you have a lot more freedom than you do with traditional interfaces. Um, and finally, I'd say that interfaces, um, uh, and maybe to sum up this bit, is where um, yeah, this messiness of bodies and analog systems comes back. The, the way you're interacting with a computer is, is more often than not in our world. It, it's, a, it's a balance between control and chaos, and the, the, you know, the, the uncontrolled body is, is always still there, and it's, um, it's always raising its, its problematic head. I'm just going to play a little video of Atto and I performing. You can see that. It's kind of... Two guys trying really hard to send text messages. Um, but this is the, the idea of the gestures and things that might emerge. I'm going to with this young. play it all, but I think I was trying to just show a little bit of what we do, or what we have done, um, and sort of, yeah, I think you can see that idea, this creating certain types of music anyway, it was the way of trapping the body, um, and, and, and a very bodily music, um, a very organic, analog music, with, but with a very, you know, couldn't be made with anything other than digital tools. Um, and finally, um, I think that in music we find lots of ways where we encounter um, uh, the sort of digital as an aesthetic. Um, and uh, the digital is something that's often black box and understood through metaphors. I know that Julian Oliver has sort of written about this and I've read some really interesting interviews with him where he's talking about his practice trying to, to undo or open those black boxes. But the idea that we understand things through... Um, uh, through, through metaphors and through, um, you know, the desktop and things like that, which have this illusion of, of clarity, um, but, uh, but actually is completely masking the way a system's working. And I think that music is an area where we find that these imaginations of what the digital is and what analog is come quite to the fore as often things that are, that are just um, aesthetics and, and that don't really have much to do with what analog and digital actually are or how they actually work in our lives. Um, so the analog, it's this warm, authentic, human, live, real, whether it's the sort of some squelchy sound of, a, of an analog synth with these warm harmonic distortion, that, or, you know, vinyl records and, and whiskey and an old man with a guitar. And <laughs> the digital is this cold, inhuman thing. The performances are boring. There's a, there's a laptop. There's a, someone's pressing, a, but they're checking their email. It's not got these rich sounds and it... it, it, it 
it's, I think that this is well, certainly rooted in some truths. Um, I think that you can see how it's this a dichotomy that's, that's set up, and, um, and I'm not too sure is, is always true. You know, we can make analog sounding music on digital systems, um, and uh, a lot of, you know, uh, you know, these you know, whatever authentic sounding country records probably assembled in Pro Tools from loads of sessions. And the, the arguments are really about um, authenticity and about style, about preferences for certain types of systems, or about politics. And analog and digital become representative of these, but it, again, it's got very little to do with them. So I think that a lot of the, um, yeah, the, the metaphors and ideas and ways in which people might conceptualise the digital, uh, falsely conceptualise it, are sort of found in, in music. And then, uh, sort of, this is, a, again, a slightly off-topic slide, but I couldn't resist this. The Daily Mail is a newspaper we have in the UK designed exclusively for stupid people. Um, and they had to point out due the cloud hack that the, the cloud was not an actual cloud. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and while this is kind of trivial, the fact that we do, you know, there are these words, the cloud, and people actually, yeah, our understanding of this is, is through these kind of, these metaphors, which are often um, a bit daft. Um, and I wanted to play you some digital music. I think this is music that really encapsulates a very particular digital aesthetic. Just a little bit of, this is Ryoji Okada, um, who's wonderful. Um, It's really good, and there's probably no need for me to play it all, but I do really, um, I think that, yeah, we find, you know, these, these very kind of crisp sounds and these certain kind of visuals and aesthetics. This might be the kind of music that people are imagining as being this, this digital music. And of course, there's lots of music that's actually, you know, doesn't sound anywhere near as digital as this, but is just as digital. But nonetheless, you have these kind of extremes and ideas here. And finally, here, is all of the analog synths, you, all the analog VSTs that you can put on your computer to make all that harsh, cold, inhuman digital accounting <laughs> music sound like the warm, authentic, good old time stuff that, that people love. Um, I think that's the end of my, my ramble. Um, but, um, and I don't know if you, we were, maybe we should answer any questions together if yes, you want yeah. to do it. Sounds good. <laughs> okay. Good. So, since we didn't co coordinate this without coordinating it, there's some overlap, but not too much. Um, and so I'll extend uh, uh, what Adam. Uh, presented a bit in a technical direction and then a bit more um, in uh, what this actually means for myself making instruments with these technologies. So, um, yeah, this in a diagrammatic form is the misunderstanding of digital sound. <laughs> uh, and in fact, this is the way I was taught it. Um, uh, I am myself a, a composer. Uh, I've played, unlike Adam, traditional acoustic musical instruments. And, uh, and being about 20 years older than Adam, um, uh, in my time, I accompanied the switchover uh, from uh, analog to digital. So that um, it was at the uh, electronic studio, music studios at Harvard, where, where I met Cage, in fact, that uh, the year of my graduation, I helped uh, the composer, Ivan Sharepnin, who was my teacher, transform the studio from the analog modular uh, synthesis studio to the MIDI digital DX7 uh, studio. And this was the picture that we had in our head. <laughs> now, um, and this is the red line is why, um, as Adam says, um, digital is cold and sharp and sterile. And the gray line is why uh, analog is uh, warm. Um, but as Adam indicated, we do experience both of these sounds as the same. 
because they do come out of a speaker uh, in the sense that uh, uh, by the time uh, the signal is coming out of the speaker, you're not hearing the red line at all, but there is a, technically a significant amount of electronic circuitry uh, to reconstitute the gray line from the data that is the red line. And so in fact, this is really our, met well, it's not a metaphor really, but it is our image of digital, it is a representational image that's only partially true. Um, so this picture is similar, but it's a bit truer, uh, at least from a signal point of view. In signal processing, um, uh, uh, we are uh, confronting in these two images the difference uh, between analog and digital in terms of signal terms in that analog, um, and in this case, as you've noticed, we're not using um, um, etymology of anal analogy, etc., but really uh, signal uh, processing theory. Uh, analog signal is a continuous uh, signal, whereas digital um, signal is discrete domain um, signal. And it's in connecting the dots that our analog reconstitution filters will uh, uh, recreate an analog sound that is analog by the time you hear it. So this is similar um, in all the interfaces then that we've been thinking about. And um, when Heather gave her talk uh, yesterday, it was great to see all the other interfaces that uh, gamers, art gamers, and game artists are using, and a couple of questions came up that, okay, uh, maybe perhaps we're um, in, um, interacting with these games in, in new ways uh, now, thanks to uh, products such as the Microsoft Kinect, uh, the Nintendo Wii, etc. cetera. Um, well, yes, but maybe no, in the sense that, uh, again, given the number of gray hairs that I've got, um, when the Kinect came out, I was only reminded of having met the great artist David Rokeby uh, back in the 80s, who himself, as an artist, engineer, and critical engineer, to use Julian Oliver's terms, will evoke Julian in his absence, um, um, that David Rokeby, as such an artist engineer, made that only a corporation like Microsoft could finally make 30 years later. Rokeby had, uh, back in the 80s, a system called the Very Nervous System, which was a camera capture, an interface system with which he performed. Um, yeah, the mouse cursor is his, not mine. Yeah, but, uh, so, and even closer to Kinect, I mean, he wasn't the only one. There was a Canadian artist, engineer, Vincent John Vincent, who on the Amiga computer system created a system called the Mandala, uh, where we see a very Kinect-like image of the user uh, superimposed over, in this case, virtual percussion drums, and by waving your arms around, uh, it was uh, a game-like activity um, to play virtual percussion. So uh, I would argue that these technologies have not only been around for 30 years, but they have been artist-led. And, and quite often uh, by artists who are working in a musical domain. Um, and why is that? It's because, if we flip back um, to here, um, this was the best representation of the digitization of media back in the day because you could fit it onto a, a page, a 2D sheet to say, here is digital. And, and, and it's not just because the, of the convenience of, of sound being projected to a flat plane, but in fact, Having only two dimensions, time and amplitude in this case, or frequency and, and time, um, sound was a much lighter medium to digitize, uh, and it took up much less data. As we know, it took, we had Pro Tools uh, for editing sound 10 years before we had Final Cut for editing video, and this is partly because of the processing power uh, of computers back then allowed sound a lighter medium uh, to be dealt with digitally much earlier, a decade earlier than image, uh, and moving image. Um, so, so the reflections of musical practice, I think, in the digital do predate, or we've been thinking about this uh, for a bit longer, um, and particularly in terms of questions of interaction, because sound is a, time, is a temporal time-based medium, uh, and music, therefore, is, 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 is uh, uh, temporal as well. But just to continue on with my historical 
rant. So then we have Oculus Rift and everyone's excited about it, but we do remember that it was Jaron Lanier uh, founding a company called VPL Research to do early commercial virtual reality that we did have uh, the stereoscopic head-mounted displays. So this again is what was happening in California uh, with companies, uh, small startups that were founded um, in the mid to late 80s. So just to come back from our game controllers and interfaces and virtual rea reality display devices to music, which is what we do, um, I would say, in fact, there's, there's the best instruments that we had for digital music come from this time, and they've only gotten poorer since then. So same era. Maybe I'm attached to this era because it was in these days that I was doing um, my studies. Um, but we had these really cool products. I mean, these were for sale and uh, made by companies like Akai and Yamaha. As MIDI came out very quickly, um, uh, we sought to find, find more interesting interfaces, uh, in this case, using analogies of existing instruments as ways to control digital sound synthesizers. So these are, uh, in the top case, um, um, uh, a clarinet-like woodwind MIDI controller, and in the bottom case, a Kai's uh, brass instrument. This is meant to be a trumpet of sorts. Um, and so you have ways to access this with your breath. Um, you, if, if the bottom one is a trumpet, you have the three keys to, to, to give you what the valves of the trumpet should be doing. And then on this thing at the end, um, it's, a, it's a kind of rotating wheel. So if you're Louis Armstrong, you might be opening up your um, uh, uh, plumber's plunger uh, to go wah, wah, uh, you could do that. Um, yeah. So these instrument builders thought of all these ways of um, uh, taking the form factor of existing instruments, um, uh, our uh, corporal relationship with existing instruments to try to map them over to um, the digital sphere. And again, this is in the 80s. 30 years later, as digital music making and um, popular electronic music has become much more widespread, I would say the interfaces have actually become poorer. So these are the kinds of interfaces we have today to control uh, um, uh, the software that we run on our laptops. So this immediately is more digital because it's, it's, uh, it's a matrix uh, of switches and buttons um, on and off, so binary in its operation, uh, and information uh, uh, organized, displayed, and captured uh, in discrete form. Okay? So whereas these instruments try to capture with the spinning of the wheel or the intensity of the breath, continuous bodily signal, so therefore analog, continuous, our new interfaces are capturing finger tapping in discrete ways. Okay, uh, so, so in, in, in some senses, these are all digital instruments, but perhaps this one is digital in its way of operation, discrete, and the others were analog, despite the fact that they were um, uh, 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 despite the fact that they are interfacing to digital synthesizers. So if we go back to David Rokeby's pixelated image and a typical uh, living room scenario, this is what your Kinect sees. <laughs> and that's what you have to do to calibrate it. Well, what really has happened um, in those 30 years? Um, what has changed? Well, the resolution has changed. Uh, um, in some ways, Rokeby's image from the 80s is pixelated, and so therefore evokes a more digital uh, uh, sense. Um, but the modern day technology is actually operating at this uh, thousands of times higher resolution. Um, so resolution, computing speed, et cetera, have improved in that time. But have our ideas really changed since then? If the artist-driven projects in the 80s uh, were invented, constructed, and performed with back in the day, 30 years before a corporation like Microsoft could market a, a video game controller, um, perhaps our imaginations were running ahead of the technology. Um, now that the technology is richer in terms of resolution and speed, 
perhaps our ideas themselves have gotten poorer. And so here in lies a kind of a paradox or a contradiction of terms um, that perhaps it is in the inherent limitations of technology um, that established for us an image of the digital that today we continue to hold despite the fact that the actual uh, treatment and processes uh, that these technologies allow are fast enough to be nearly analog and continuous. Okay. So the question here then is that, is digital then a kind of self-imposed condition? Okay. Anyway, so to take this and to think about how we might make musical instruments, this will be the, the, the second part of my talk. Um, Adam mentioned these different interfaces. Uh, yeah, besides using cameras and uh, alternate MIDI controllers that used the, the analogy of existing instruments, woodwind instruments or brass instruments or keyboard instruments, there was a very rich field um, which we represent, or which I represent certainly, um, uh, of new musical instrument design and creation. And so this is the Dutch composer and artist uh, who passed away a couple of years ago, Michel Weisvis, uh, who famously um, has the studio that continues today called Stein, the Studio for Electro-Instrumental Music in Amsterdam. And this is the instrument that he created called the Hands, uh, which has um, circuit boards, uh, the ultrasound sensors that Mark uh, mentioned that are on the Hands here. Uh, and different uh, mercury switches and et cetera that could detect the rotation of the hands. So the, um, the instrument functions um, by rotating, uh, getting a couple of ultrasound beams focused to each other, and then allowing the distance between the hands um, to be detected. Okay? So it's an entirely new musical instrument that, again, created using digital technology, but that facilitate um, analog corporal action and control and articulation of sound. So with great artists as Michel, as our, as our older brothers in the field, for us as young upstarts in the day, we made our rock bands. Um, and uh, so this is, this, is, this is the band, Sensor Band, um, uh, that uh, Mark mentioned in 1993, we're playing the Paradiso uh, in Amsterdam, and it's a rock band configuration. It's a trio. Uh, the drummer should be in the back. That's the late Zbigniew Kankowski. But instead of having drum set, they're infrared beams uh, that are um, uh, armed on his scaffolding cage. And indeed, he will create striking gestures to trigger uh, percussive sounds. Edwin van der Heide uh, on the left, working with the hands um, of Stein. And then, um, uh, in my case, working with uh, biosignal interfaces, so picking up muscle tension uh, on the electromyogram signal, so taking electricity directly from the body as uh, an input to the digital musical system. Uh, so this extends the idea of the instrument by creating a rock bad looking setup <laughs> wasn't just it was a rock band looking setup. We did drink lots of beer and you know, we did all the things a rock band is supposed to do. But, in, but actually it's a trio like any other trio, uh, uh, a jazz trio or a string trio. Is there a problem? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a uh, Oh yeah. yeah. So, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking too loud. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we just want to be able to yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so the trio of musical instruments is uh, established form, regardless of the style of music, and typically they're based around families of musical instruments. A string trio would be a trio of stringed instruments playing in different registers, a violin, viola, and cello. They are instruments that, are, that share a mode of action, uh, so that are similar. They are stringed instruments, they are bowed or plucked, uh, but they are different in the register in which they play. The claim here is that we created sensor instruments, digital musical instruments that capture body uh, movement, but each in its own different mode of action. Um, in my case, signals directly from the body afford certain kind of sounds, whereas Karkovsky's infrared beam cutting affords percussion sounds. So uh, the idea here is perhaps we have a family of sensor instruments that are similar 
they're in the same family because they're sensory instruments, but they're each differentiated one from the other by their mode of action. We went on to take this musical instrument uh, concept um, to create impossible musical instruments, one where the instrument, uh, in terms of scale, becomes bigger than the performer or a single stringed instrument in this case. This is bigger than a contrabass, um, but uh, yeah, at 12 meters high, um, in fact, becomes a multi-user instrument. This is called sound net, and by climbing on it, we would stretch these uh, shock absorbers that were based, uh, we worked with a Harley Davidson mechanic to make this um, <laughs> instrument, that would stretch um, uh, uh, shock absorbers here, uh, and, um, and the potentiometer, the linear potentiometer alongst each of these would send a continuous uh, varying signal as if you're turning a knob on a synthesizer but doing it by uh, climbing activity. So digital or analog, uh, what for me was important was to think about what is it that constitutes a musical instrument and this is something I've thought about uh, and written about a bit and since I am someone who has played analog instruments it is, or uh, sorry, acoustical instruments. It's, it's natural for me to use the acoustical instrument as the gold standard in some ways, or the um, uh, point of departure. Uh, so if we take a, an instrument that we know and love, such as the violin, it's a musical instrument. Few people would um, doubt it or argue with it. Um, if we move to something like the electric guitar, we still accept that it's a musical instrument, obviously, of course. Um, but an electric guitar, actually, if you don't have the rest of it, doesn't sound like much, really. You know, you've got to plug it in to an amplifier to get any sound at all. And um, while some purists may plug uh, the guitar straight into the amp, most guitars, to, to get their special sound, will go through a pedal effects and so forth. And this is all obvious, but suddenly, in terms of systems architecture, so if we bring back a little bit of uh, our signals and computing thinking to this, well suddenly the musical instrument has suddenly become exploded and is an extended system. Okay. Now if we go to um, uh, uh, technologies that are less accepted as musical instruments today, what can, how can we think about this from a musical instrument point of view? So a turntable is a record player. It was a technology made to consume music. Uh, but DJs uh, use a couple at a time with a mixer uh, in the middle to play music for you in, in clubs. Um, but we've also had um, the arrival and the development of turntable artists, turntablists, who really are musical uh, and instrumental in their way of working with this system, which like the electric guitar is probably an extended system. You need two turntables, uh, a DJ mixer in the middle, uh, and a very sophisticated uh, performance practice of manipulating the knobs and the records, etc. But this goes, to, in my eyes, one step further than the extended system uh, architecture of an electric guitar. Uh, it is an extended system, but actually, worse yet, the turntables won't make any sound by themselves until you put a vinyl record on them. So what's missing here in this picture are, is the, the DJ crate of records that uh, um, uh, he carries around. So here I would argue that this is an mus extended musical instrument system that actually doesn't have any musical content on it. Um, so it's a contentless musical instrument until the musician uh, puts some content or selects some content to put on it. So if this becomes ways of thinking about how we can take the accepted notion of musical instrument and extend it, I mean, because these are technologies, aren't they? To extend uh, musical instrument thinking, musical instrument building thinking, uh, uh, and, and, and to think about how we can accommodate that concept with new technologies. Let's extend it and, and build instruments with these sophisticated sensor uh, systems. So, what you see on the left is a kind of um, um, picture of, of what my system with the muscles uh, works with. Um, it, they, they are hospital electrodes that are placed along a muscle group um, that are making an electrical contact with the skin and amplifying the neuron impulses of muscle contraction. 
So when we tense a muscle, I have to roll up the sleeves here, um, it is our brain signaling through an internal neuronal signal system to tell our muscle to tense. And the muscle tenses because there's a flow of electricity um, along the neuron that makes the muscle um, cell contract and become shorter. Well, we can, this is an electrical signal. It's an analog electrical signal um, that can be detected by the electrodes sent and amplified so that it can be seen. It can be amplified, then digitized and entered into the computer. On the right, we have something a bit different. This is your image from the Kinect. Okay? Um, so the Kinect sees uh, a kind of a vague, uh, somewhat pixelated blob, uh, which, which is, um, given the right calibration, will figure out can be a head, a couple of arms, and a torso. And um, as Adam mentioned, and, and as a digital process, it, it's reductionist in that it reduces the blob into a skeleton. And so what the, um, it's again the famous red line, you know, in the, the staircase um, in the digital, in digital audio signal, and in this case, the skeletal reduction of, of, of the user. So actually, the richness of the body is gone. Okay? You are but a line uh, reduced to a series of joint positions. And so it's really just picking up static position uh, of these joints, and those become dynamic information, moving information, um, only um, in an image-like way of frame after frame. Uh, so again, I would claim this is a kind of discrete process, uh, which is very different than the continuous signal uh, that we're getting uh, from the body. And, and I compare these two. Um, my muscle system is much more exotic and harder to implement, but these are the kinds of things that are today becoming quite popular. In video games, we see a lot of new interfaces for brain-computer interfaces. Uh, there's been a, there's been a um, Kickstarter uh, startup um, for a product called the Mayo, which puts a bracelet on your arm and supposedly picks up muscle contraction. So these are the things that are really on the cusp of, of becoming popular. Um, but what's the difference? What, where, is the, where does the richness lie, um, etc.? cetera? Um, yeah, so here we have questions of, and theories of embodied interaction coming from human-computer interaction research. Paul Durish is a, a leading figure uh, in the field. And for him, embodied interaction wasn't just a question of the body. It is a question in what he calls a participative status, uh, a kind of conversation between the body and the technology. And in this sense, interaction um, with these digital systems isn't a one-way control uh, paradigm, uh, but bidirectional, where the, this, um, the processes that you may be influencing uh, in the computer also output and may influence you in return. Okay. Now, we've used interfaces um, with uh, <coughs> metaphors or analogies of, of existing instruments, uh, and then we move into these completely uh, new instruments that we saw with, with Michel Weisfuss, and now uh, the possibility to get an invisible instrument by putting sensors, by, well, by pointing a camera at our body in the simple case, or by putting sensors directly on the body in, in the real case. And this, we won't have time for here, is, is where the actual research begins, okay, is uh, how do we then create the satisfaction, the visceral uh, satisfaction that for myself as an acoustical instrumentalist had, holding the wood of a violin hmm, or the brass uh, of a trumpet with these supposed virtual uh, technologies, short of giving myself a piece of wood to hold and grasp what can we do, what, what can we recreate with these um, sophisticated sensor systems at a moment when we don't have the boundary object, if the technology has allowed us to dematerialize um, the musical instrument to an invisible one, or collapse the musical instrument into the body that performs it, nonetheless, we, in order to exert, to create effort, and all that analog um, uh, in between, let's say, of the zero and one, we need to find strategies to capture the gesture, to produce the gesture, and to think about gesture, okay? um, uh, that somehow extend the way that we used to work 
uh, in the material um, domain. So those are the, so actually, so that, that opens up a whole can of worms, which is the topic of, of another lecture. But I'll just finish um, with a little video uh, of SSS. And this, whereas Adam's video um, showed us uh, the iPhone instrument where, interestingly, the sensitivity of the accelerometers caused us to not, to start with an instrument that could capture your movements like a Wii controller, but ended up to create interesting movement to concentrate and try not to move. Right? And then in this case, um, with SSS, we'll see a, another trio, a band, ultras, um, ultrasound sensors for Cecile, who's running um, uh, graphics, Laurent Dayo playing on a very old analog gestural instrument, the theremin, and myself on the muscle sensors. So we'll just play a couple minutes of this and then finish. two glasses, I guess, since um, there are two, you, you guys get to have the water I'll do without. Um, thank you very much, Adam and Natal, for, for this um, very um, insightful and intriguing um, presentation on the state of, um, well, well, in the field of, you know, uh, analog, digital music interfacing, and what, what, is, what is analog, what is digital. I thought, found it very, very clarifying, you know, the, the points you were making, that music when it reaches us is always analog, and, and the way the digital can be heard can, is, is very, very different. You know, there is that, you know, digital aesthetic, but digital doesn't have to sound digital. It, you have all these emulators for making analog sounds. Um, I, I have a number of questions, but maybe the first one that comes to mind is, you know, you guys work together, you perform music, we're going to hear you tonight. Um, and I, I wonder, you know, whether, you know, what, what kind of conversations you have when you're making music together, because you said yourself, you, the first instrument you played was a computer, right? You grew up playing, 
um, using the computer as an instrument. And you come from a completely different background. You grew up, you know, with classical instruments, and then went on to make these um, these sensor instruments. But but that obviously formatted your approach to to making music. So is there like a generational or just a different way of approaching things where you find you have productive differences when you make music or the way you you, you think about things or well, is that, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, so, it, it does actually just feel maybe like two people turning up with instruments, and those instruments might be these strange digital electronic things, but turning up with instruments and discussing the sounds that we like and making sounds and figuring out sort of things that work, as in we could be doing it with guitars to the other maybe disagree. Yeah, I think I, if I use the musical instrument uh, metaphor, mm -hmm. um, uh, maybe I'm being old-fashioned, but... I think it's a very rich uh, tradition. And, and so the ways that we are mus musicians don't change. Um, we don't like to rehearse, so we try to avoid the conversation for a long time. Um, uh, but also I did quite try to create systems where uh, group performance, eye-to-eye -eye communication and those things that come uh, from musical performance practice are preserved um, somehow. Am I supposed to be looking at you? <laughs> <laughs> That's why we never know when to stop. Um, but, uh, but perhaps the, 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 the point in music that was the conver convergence point was, I mean, we've been performing together uh, for about six, seven years. Um, uh, the, the common ground, in, in fact, was the sort of earlier era of laptop music that, uh, that became very popular, uh, where it wasn't instrumental performance, where whether we weren't sure whether the performer was checking their email on stage, uh, uh, but became a, a kind of lingua franca of, of, uh, of, of style and of, of yeah, recent releases uh, that I had come into myself uh, um, uh, as an old timer in the field, discovering it in an interesting way, and where Adam um, was coming into it as a young uh, practitioner of that area. So that, that's the point where I feel like there was overlap. Mm. Yeah. So what, what really strikes me in the examples you showed is, is the corporeal, corpo, corpo reality of you know using these interfaces, you know, as opposed to someone you know in front of the laptop and you know just hitting hitting on the keys. I thought it was a very um, uh, uh, powerful. Um, argument you made that you know maybe our our ideas have become poorer when if if that is the status quo of the interface where you're just you know turning it on off having that discrete interaction and and thank you very much for that because that is the most precise definition um, that I know of and the one I was introduced to when I started media studies you know studying under Friedrich Hitler he said digital it's all about discreteness it's on or off and analog is this continuous movement and then you see these interfaces like just taking the last example. Um, where the performer really becomes part of a feedback loop. And, um, and, and, and I liked what you were pointing out is how it's not a situation of control, right? You, you're not in a situation of mastery over your instrument, but you're playing it and being played at the same time because you're exposed to the feedback acoustically and visually in the sense of the video sensor. And that obviously influences what you do. So I, I don't know, do you, how, what, what's well, the experience of playing these instruments? Title, it's in fact, is the phonograph mm -hmm. is, is one of the words in that uh, uh, title, and typewriter is the other. So if for Adam, uh, uh, the computer being a data processing device and, a, and, a, and a, just a souped up typewriter, uh, and for me, considering the phonograph as potentially a musical instrument, mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, there's something there. And, and, and Kittler was really quite um, uh, insightful, in fact. Uh, not directly talking about music, but about the effects that we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. I think I'd like to just slightly stick up for yeah. the Akai, um, that little lo lo the, the, the Novation Launchpad, isn't it? Which, which I think is almost more in maybe in a lineage to things like the, the interface for like an 808 or a 909, or like sequencers and things and the triggering. And even mm -hmm. if there's a, a f even if there's a delay in the loop between, I think that, that playing these instruments is still embodied, even if every movement of the body isn't necessarily captured, you're still hearing the sound through the body, reacting to it. I mean, you see how often people might, might be dancing behind their computers when they're playing, and then even if there's a delay before you press that button to affect something in the, the next sequence, and it's not this instant sort of um, control, there's still this sort of feedback loop of, of, of listening and a body and an interface. And I think even, even when it's live coding and it is quite mediated mm -hmm. by something like that, or, or it's mediated by this sort of on-off bluntness, I still think there's, there's still this quite, they can still be quite embodied 
interactions yes. with the computer. Th th thank you very much for keeping us back on balance, because I really don't want to tip over to one side or the other. And I actually just had a student do her final project on your know, digital DJ, and she, she had never done analog DJ. She learned it on a digital system with MP3s, and then for her final project, she relearned mixing with vinyl, so she understood where they were coming from. But she made a very powerful point that, mm. you know, it's not better or worse, it's just a completely different mm. experience. And we have different configurations of the analog and the digital in these different mi musical setups that can all be quite intriguing. So I have, I have my first question here, and I'll pass the microphone, or could we have the, the microphone over here? And I, again, offer everyone, if you don't want to phrase your question in English, I will do spontaneous translations. All right. This time I will make it in English. Um, you talked, uh, first of all, I liked very much this last concert, the three people playing together and uh, creating images and sound all together. But you have been talking about the Tarkovsky uh, thing. Maybe I didn't no, quite no, get it's, it. It's not the film director Tarkovsky, but my collaborator in the first band was Zbigniew Karkovsky. Ah, Sorry. Ah, yeah. I uh, wondered, yeah, because no. <laughs> this, I, I would have liked to see the combination of these, this artist and what you are doing. So. Maybe for a future project, so sorry. <laughs> it would be fascinating. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. yes, please, can we pass the microphone over to Gabriel? So thanks uh, for those two talks. They were really amazing. Um, and I guess I think I'm just asking for a little bit more elaboration uh, for what you brought up, Atao, where you kind of mentioned um, that when you're using sensors, you still kind of desire for some sort of... Um, you know, object. Um, and so first I wanted to hear a little bit more about what that object does uh, for you as a musician. I don't have any kind of musical background. And then I was a little bit um, unclear as to the status of the body uh, when it comes to the music made by sensors. Can the body ever become an instrument mm -hmm. in the way that like a violin is? Mm -hmm. um, or is the body kind of engaging in a sort of type of bodily movement so that it's almost um, a practice where dance is kind of melding with music. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a perfect question. And thank you, Gabrielle. Um, and I'll take that in reverse order, I think. Uh, I am not a dancer, but I have been mistaken to be the dancer, especially with this last group, uh, SSS, um, where the two musicians who clearly have systems uh, uh, set up and do sound check, and I show up with bracelets and you know, not, not have a computer in front of me, uh, and, and then the, the technician said, okay, you musicians do your sound check, and the dancer, where do we put, how do we light him? Um, <laughs> that was, uh, well, and so the gestures, the reason I played that last video is because it is digital music, um, but uh, that, that doesn't sound, have that digital aesthetic. Okay. Um, even though the, the, the imagery uh, are, are pixels and lines, but they are, are flowing, uh, I think, in a continuous um, way. Um, now, those are resulting from gestures of the body that are picked up by uh, fairly sophisticated systems, um, but we have not made a theater production of this. It is not choreographed movement. Indeed, we're not trained uh, dancers at all. Um, so does that give us license to do it, or does it change the nature of what we're doing? Well, it, it does. It, it, we are making music, and, and that's it. Um, uh, if we were to give the same system to a, to a dancer, it would be a very different result. Um, and, and so this is to say that, well, dancers do uh, have, have, are used to working with movement and sound together, uh, but um, uh, and there are some projects of interactive dance. I've always sort of shied away from them because by putting a sensor on a dancer doesn't automatically uh, uh, close the loop, in fact, because their perceptual loop in terms of their creating movement is in fact often um, in a conversation with in reaction to sound rather than the process of creating sound, which is what musicians do. Now, the fact that we're not trained dancers may mean that our movements are maybe more awkward uh, um, um, uh, because it's not choreographed, but then this is what we're after in some ways because, uh, again, to make the comparison with acoustical instruments, uh, most musicians move when they play an instrument. And often this movement may not have to do with the physics of the instrument. 
a pianist may play and make a lovely gesture up, but a piano is ultimately a percussion instrument. Once you let go of the key, you're not affecting the sound anymore. So is that movement up a choreography? Is it theatrical? Well, for Liberace, yes, but it's not just for the theat over-theatrical pianists. Very few pianists play as robots. Or if, if a saxophonist digs in, that's not affecting the acoustics of the conical bore in any way. Is that theater? Well, no. It does help in the actual phrasing of the sound. So these are what we call um, uh, ancillary gestures that are not directly necessary for the mechanics and acoustics of an instrument, but that are uh, extremely necessary for musical phrasing and production. Now, what I was interested in is to take these ancillary gestures and to actually capture them uh, as inputs to the system. Does that mean that the body is an instrument? Well, back in the 90s, when we'd do the festival circuit and run into artists like Stellark, who would tell us that the body is obsolete, we would counter with the body is an instrument. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and if Jaron Lanier was making virtual reality systems, yeah, I mean, we got more gigs if we said we were making virtual instruments. Um, but uh, well, that, that's, a, that's a little bit treating it lightly. Um, but yeah, if I'm interested in this sort of musical instrument thinking, I was interested indeed to see how far we could go to internalize that. And so to, 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 to answer the, f the final question about where the object uh, lies, the, the object is your boundary to the physical world and is the thing that you play um, uh, is, and is the thing that resists you, okay? Um, uh, now, once that materiality has the possibility to go away, uh, where do we find the resistance is, is the question. Now, uh, with, uh, the, so then the claim is, if you've just got a camera watching you, there is actually not much resistance there in a Microsoft Connect. But with a very similar free space gesture, but uh, a biosensing of sensing your own body, actually, the resistance becomes yourself, and, and there's a lot of exertion and uh, 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 an effort that needs to be made to squeeze out uh, sound. Um, so, so therein lies the question of where, how much do we pay attention to the interface? And uh, this is, I think, one of the issues in um, interface design, and Paul Durish certainly talks about it. He evokes Heidegger in saying, okay, we can think of these things as present at hand, or ready to hand, are we thinking about the, th the thing itself and focusing on the mouse or the object, or are we playing through that in, in a uh, device in a transparent way? And I think um, musicians are accustomed to playing through. We don't focus on the violin. The violin becomes a conduit through which uh, um, uh, uh, the music is articulated. In computing technology, we often focus too much on the interface. What is he doing? Uh, how does that thing work? And, and maybe this is um, uh, why uh, and Heather uh, remarked that, OK, with her drawing piece with the ball, she imagined a smooth gesture, but we didn't get it. Well, the technology is still very young. Maybe we also didn't get it because the users of her system were focused on the device and how it might be capturing the gesture. And certainly, yeah, if, you, if you pick up a, an object, an interactive system in an exhibition, you use it for three minutes, you, you're not gonna get it. If for musicians like us, again, using that metaphor, we don't like to practice, but we do stick with the same instrument for years and get used to it, well then we get to a, a fluidity with it where we can maybe start to, to play through uh, these instruments, even if they're digital. Do you still have it, Gabriela? Oh, no. I have a question over here. If uh, I'll pass, oh, please. Uh, thank you very much for this. Uh, two very, very interesting presentations and the um, and the talk about uh, the question: How could there be an image of the digital or an acoustic image of the digital? When we hear electronic noise, we know, oh, it's digital and it's clearness or it's cold. And it, um, when you um, talk, um, talked about the musical instruments accepted as musical instruments and the less accepted instruments, I was reminded uh, on the the, um, the catastrophe when Bob Dylan went to play electric guitars. 
because that was not okay. It was hardly an instrument for the fans. So that uh, made me think that um, we always need the new media to accept and, uh, and, and appreciate the flaws of the good old ones. And, and that reminded me on this, um, of this uh, Madonna CD. I don't know which one in the late 90s, starting with the scratches of vinyl to say, oh, we know, uh, like post-digital, we, we really appreciate the old things that we didn't appreciate before. And uh, so maybe that's another way of bridging this gap, not only that we only can um, uh, sense analog music, no matter of, of the source of digital, electronic, uh, or violins, old style, no matter. Uh, but the other thing is that we always um, uh, close this, this gap by appreciating the old by knowing the new, and um, so it's always um, only together working in that sense, maybe, I don't know. Well, these are two defining moments in musical history. Bob Dylan at the Newport Jazz Festival going electric was indeed a scandal. I'm a little bit too young to have been there myself, um, but I am not too young to have been there when Madonna released. Um, <laughs> and in fact, no, there's a story to go with this, not to answer everything with a joke, um, but as, as as we say, it was in that era of music, laptop music, glitch music, that Adam and I came together. And we've um, uh, worked uh, with some of the, the well-known artists in this, in this realm. In fact, we've created a, uh, some of the iPhone, first iPhone software that the, the Viennese artist Fenez used uh, on stage. And the story goes, uh, and Fenez, uh, for those who don't know his music, is one of the early exponents of laptop mixed with guitar, but this glitch aesthetic. And uh, the story goes that Fenez was sitting on a plane going on tour uh, somewhere, and uh, the Bonad Madonna track came on. And it started with the <laughs> And he said, shit, she's ripped us off. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, well, uh, but otherwise, yeah, I would say, is this, is this uh, uh, because musicians are conservative? Is it because we are uh, reminiscing about old times? Yeah, it feels like very, we get these, I mean, um, I wouldn't be surprised if cassettes probably one of the most popular medium, media for consuming music in East Berlin at the minute, isn't it? Maybe there's how we old media are very much fetishised and, and old sounds, things get sort of become um, cultural things as much as anything. So what we think of as being digital sound will just work as this, this cultural thing in, in, um, in the same way that, you know, yeah, analog, analog music, or the cassette music. Sort of, I don't know. These these sounds get detached from their actual how they're produced and the the way in which they're produced and become just sort of cultural things. Yeah, so that cassette revival, which is very much in, in in vogue right now, is this a return to materiality? I think. Uh, yeah. Well, um, I, I I have. Uh, further questions, but I think I'll catch you in the break, okay. which we will have in, in a bit. And I'm uh, very much looking forward, and I would like to remind everyone that we do have a performance on tonight. Um, we have, I also see, um, uh, we have two performances tonight. I see Simon Vincent is here, and, and Atal and Adam, Adam will be performing after the final presentation. But um, right now, I'd just like to say thank you for this um, very intriguing presentation, both of your presentations, and, um, and um, say thank you, and then I'll pass the word on to Yana.